Good morning or afternoon, depending on where you are joining us from. My name is Kristen Jowers, and I am a program coordinator for OneOp. It's my pleasure to welcome you to today's session on helping clients inflation-proof their budget. In case you're joining us for the first time, I'd like to give you a brief tour of our webinar platform so you can find your way around. Hopefully you're currently able to view the slides we're sharing. If you are unable to see them or have any other difficulties, please send us a tech support request by email at contact at oneop.org. Note that the slides and resources are available for download on the event page for today's session. We will be covering continuing education information at the end of the webinar, so please stay tuned at the end if you're interested. As some of you have already done, we look forward to having you join us in the chat pod for conversation and questions. To embed the chat pod so you don't miss any links or conversation, simply place your cursor over the shared slides. You will then see a toolbar pop up across the bottom of your screen. From there, click the chat pod bubble icon. When typing in questions or comments, please be sure to select everyone from the response options drop down menu so everyone is able to view your questions in the chat pod. We do have closed captioning enabled for today's session, and you can turn those on via the toolbar. Thank you for joining us as we continue our partnership with the Department of Defense and the U.S. Department of Agriculture to expand the readiness, knowledge, and networks of the professionals supporting our military service members and their families. This webinar is part of OneOps Food Security in Focus programming collection. Visit the website to learn more about our focus on expanding food security for military families. Today, we are joined by our presenter, Dr. Jennifer Hunter. Dr. Hunter serves as the University of Kentucky College of Agriculture, Food and Environment as the Interim Director of the School of Human Environmental Sciences and Ex Assistant Extension Director for Family and Consumer Sciences. Dr. Hunter is also an Extension Professor in the School of Human Environmental Sciences. Dr. Hunter is native Kentuckian and graduate of the University of Kentucky. She began her career with the Kentucky Cooperative Extension Service in 2001 as an extension associate. Today, her background includes a large cross-section of extension experience ranging from county agent to state specialist and CES administrator. Dr. Hunter has held primary appointments in the three principal extension programming areas, including 4-H Youth Development, Family and Consumer Sciences, and Agriculture and Natural Resources, with community and economic development programming incorporated into each of her extension roles. Dr. Hunter has secured more than $55 million in external grants and contracts. Examples of extramural funders include the Center for Disease Control, USDA Rural Development, Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration Rural Opioid Technical Assistance, and the USDA Farm and Ranch Stress Assistance Network. Over the course of her extension career, Dr. Hunter has authored more than 150 print and electronic publications and delivered over 800 extension educational programs. At this time, I'm excited to turn things over to Dr. Jennifer Hunter. Good morning, everyone. It is a pleasure to be here with you today. Um, I am excited to address our topic 
of helping clients inflation proof their budget. And I will say that this is a title that I gave and chose, but the term inflation proofing is really and truly somewhat of a misnomer that um, we cannot stop inflation, that it is part of our life. But today we will discuss how to help service members address current inflation pressures and how to prepare them um, against future inflation risk. So as we get started today, I wanted to discuss a little bit about our goals. Then we're gonna start fairly basic and talk about what is inflation, what causes inflation, who is impacted by inflation, and then we're going to move into how is it that we adapt a household budget, how do we plan, how do we set long and short-term strategies, and how do we prepare for what is next. So we'll kick off with what is inflation and what is it that we need to know about it and what do we need to communicate to the service members that you work with about inflation. And I want to start with the most basic definition of inflation. So inflation is the general rise in prices over a period of time. As prices rise, as an, in, an individual's purchasing power is going to decrease. So that makes sense, correct? As prices go up, the amount that we can afford to buy goes down. Uh, the Bureau of Labor Statistics, or sometimes you'll see it written as BLS, collects pricing data on nearly 95,000 products, goods, and services on a monthly basis. It is this pricing data that is used to assemble a basket of goods through which the inflation rate is measured. Um, however, a much easier way, I think, for clientele to visualize the concept of inflation is just using an example of a grocery store. And I like to think about it that if I am walking into the grocery store and I have $50 in my wallet or purse or whatever, my pocket, and I get my literal shopping cart, my shopping basket, my buggy, and probably whatever part of, of the country that, that you may be in and that you might call it. So I get my basket and I walk through the store and I pick up my milk, my bread, my eggs, um, chips, whatever it may be, and I put it down in my basket and I go and check out and it rings up to be $50. And I hand the cashier my $50 and I walk out of the store with my market basket of goods. If I go back into that same store the next year and I pick up again my basket or my buggy, my cart, and I walk down those same aisles and pick up the same meat and bread and eggs and chips or whatever it was that I put in that basket the year before and I go to check out and the cashier rings up my receipt and it comes up at let's say $60. Um, the difference between the two receipts represents the general rise in prices of goods over time and so I typically explain that when we're thinking about inflation is that I want to think about, I somehow need to have grown my $50 that I had last year to equal $60 this year. And if I have not been able to do that, if I haven't been able to make $50 from the year before equal $60 this year, then I'm going to have to make some decisions. I'm going to have to put items in my basket back because my purchasing power is not as great. So I may not be able to get the chips or I might need to change the brand of milk or the brand of bread that I have put in my cart to make my dollar stretch to cover my needs. Um, so again, this is a very, very simplified example, but I do think it's a concept that clientele can easily relate to when you're trying to explain the concept of inflation. Um, in general, how does inflation impact the economy? As prices rise, we as consumers can purchase less, um, which impacts both our cost of living 
and our standard of living. And eventually high inflation leads to a slowing of the economy. So let's look some about the cause of inflation. And the root cause of inflation is one of the most basic of economic principles, and that is supply and demand. And um, as, as someone that loves economics and economic principles that um, at home, I sometimes joke with my kids, especially when they were little, I would say, kids, what is supply and demand? And they would say, it's what makes the world go round, which is really an exaggeration um, to some extent, but really and truly just the basic concept of supply and demand dramatically impacts our, our economy. So demand for goods at particular prices pricing exceeds the supply of goods available at that price point is what causes inflation. So let's repeat that again. So demand for goods at a particular price exceeds the supply of the goods available at that price point. What that does is creates a supply shortage. So we have more demand than what we have of product available. Um, now, I'm certain you all can think of examples of when this has happened in your real life over the last um, several years. So in our current situation, there are several factors that have influenced inflation. And um, when we look at demand side limitations, um, that COVID directly relates. So during COVID, we had a government infusion of dollars direct to households and companies, and that increased the money supply. Um, and so when you have more money, you're able to um, demand more of a product, which can then create a supply shortage, especially if the suppliers did not see the increase in demand coming. Um, then also when we look at, at COVID, that demands for goods, actual stuff, increased significantly because consumers could not spend their dollars elsewhere. So um, whereas pre-COVID, consumers were spending dollars on travel and eating out at restaurants and experiences, all of that stopped. And so they took those dollars that may have been spent on direct consumables and started using those dollars to buy stuff, which then again created um, supply shortage. When we look on the supply side, um, again, we've already talked about COVID and the supply chain shortages that occurred during COVID. Um, we've had um, shipping issues. And then also um, an employee shortage that um, almost everywhere you went for, for a period of time post-COVID, at, at least in my community, there was help wanted signs up. And so we did not necessarily have enough people to help um, overcome that supply shortage. Um, the Ukraine also factors into this, that the invasion in the Ukraine, Ukraine Ukraine created um, increased food and energy prices. And anytime we have an increase in energy prices, there's a trickle down effect. So then we have an increase in the cost to ship goods, which will then um, ultimately increase the price of goods that we pay at the grocery store. So the consumer price index or the CPI is, um, what is reported most often in the news as a major as a measure of inflation. And so when we look from the Great Recession forward, and on this graph, the Great Recession is going to be this wide gray shaded bar. Um, when we look from the Great Recession forward, so 2008, 2009 to 2019, we had an extremely low period of inflation. Um, if you removed the more volatile measures such as energy, um, inflation averaged 2% over that two year period. And we as consumers became very accustomed to our lifestyle with that 2% inflation rate. Um, the small gray bar on the other side of the graph indicates um, the beginning of the pandemic. 
And so I want to highlight that a little bit more because the pandemic truly changed everything um, when we are looking at inflation. So in March 2021, um, which is where you see the first purple star on the screen, um, significant in increases in inflation began. Um, Currently, inflation appears to have peaked in the pandemic area in um, June of 2022 at about 9.1%, which is more than three times um, the, the Federal Reserve target rate of 2%. In January of 2023, the inflation rate was 6.4%. Um, the most recent measure of February 2023 is 6%. So we are seeing a, a trend downward in inflation. And so why is inflation coming down? Um, predominantly because of action taken by the Federal Reserve Board. And so when we look at um, the Federal Reserve, they have taken steps to increase the federal fund rate, um, which puts an upward focus on prices. Um, the federal fund rate is the target interest rate that is set by the Fed, and that's the, the price at which commercial banks borrow and lend. And so currently that is set um, a little bit over 4.5%. So it's between 4.5 and 5%. So as banks pay more, to borrow money, then ultimately the consumer will pay more to borrow money. So when we have an increase in the Fed rate, it results in the increase in the cost of borrowing to finance purchases. Um, and then we have an increase in interest rates, which rewards savings. So people tend to save more when interest is higher because you can make more on your money. You let your dollars do your work for you. So as interest rates increase, people tend to put dollars into savings as opposed to spending. And therefore we start getting some, some limits on demand. And so that's gonna help bring back in when we're looking at supply and demand and we think about that balance, if we were looking at a scale and wanting the two sides to balance, it starts bringing that balance back into check. Um, the goal is ultimately to slow consumption so that supply can catch up with demand. But the key here is we do not want to overcorrect. And that's the reason that you, you do not see a significant jump in the Fed rate, that they only move it in small increments over time, because um, an overcorrection can lead to a recession which is extremely common after periods of inflation. And so the, the Fed is obviously trying to um, prevent a recession economy. So they're just going to do small incremental increases. Um, the pr production force is, is also increasing. I, I noticed that someone um, put a note in the chat when I was talking about workforce earlier that said we still have a, a workforce supply shortage. And that is true, but it, it is improving. And so the production force is increasing. And as more people are in the workforce, more goods will be supplied, which will also ease pressure. Um, is inflation gone? No, absolutely not. Um, as we've just talked about, the Fed will likely continue to make the small incremental adjustments to the federal fund rate throughout 2023. So we'll probably continue to see um, the fund rate tick up slightly through the remainder of this year. I want to pause for just a moment because we spent just the first part of this presentation covering the very basics about what is inflation, um, how is it measured, what causes inflation, and um, how is it that we work to bring inflation back in check. And um, we can take a moment here if there's any questions that we need to address. We've had one that you might be able to add some input on in the chat. Mike asked, he said, when COVID, when the government infused money to consumers at the same time, many businesses were failing or closed for months and many people also left the market due to layoffs, choices, illnesses, deaths. So why did inflation take off so much with the overall earning cut so much? Um, there's actually a couple slides later when we talk about the, the 
the benefits that were available. So even if an individual may have experienced a wage cut um, of other benefits that may have helped supplement that, that allowed them to maintain their, their similar standard of living. So I think there's a few slides later that address that. And if not, we can come back and have a conversation about it at the end. And that was only one you're good to go on. All right, thanks, Marty. So who is impacted by inflation? This seems somewhat like a silly question because the answer is very simple, um, all of us. All individuals and families have felt the effects of inflation at some degree. Now, the degree at which we experience or impacted by inflation is certainly different, but um, all individuals have been in impacted and will continue to be impacted by inflation in some way. Um, as inflation increases, cost of living also increases. And if wages or dollars do not keep pace with the, the increased cost of living, then obviously our standard of living does decrease. So certainly all of us have been impacted by inflation. But as we talked about, that inflation has peaked. Uh, it, is, it is continuing to trend down. Uh, just between January and February, we saw a, another drop. Um, however, so are, are we good now? Are the service members that you work with good now that has inflation, that inflation has peaked? Are we headed back to normal? And um, not just yet, um, that we still need to deal with the impacts of inflation. Um, as I mentioned, that we'll still continue to to see um, incremental increases in the federal fund rate for a little while now. Um, so our goal today is to really focus in on how is it that we can help service members manage currently and deal with the inflation that they are that they are experiencing. Um, as we look back over the last several months, the cost of necessities have increased dramatically. Um, waging increases in earnings have, have leveled off. So again, then maybe our, our earnings are not keeping pace with, with inflation. And so we really want to focus on how is it that we can help a service member manage their budget in this current economic climate. So how is it that we respond? Um, First, just understanding inflation, um, what inflation is, the impacts of inflation, the, the current economy, what is going on that is causing this change of in, in prices, I think is really essential to help service members and their families mitigate the effects, that we have to understand what is causing the increase in prices to be able to develop strategies to, to deal with the changing of prices. And so first we want to start with um, covering the basics, that when working with a service member and their family, you want to cover food, medical, shelter, daily living necessities as part of your conversation. Um, that an individual may feel that the rising prices are out of their control. And to an extent that that is true, that we cannot control the price of, of eggs at the grocery store. Um, but what we can do is provide strategies that help them control their household budget and to give them back some power um, over the situation. I often think when we're working with individuals that might be struggling managing a financial change, it is um, a lot of the struggle is associated with the loss of power that that they they don't feel like there's anything that they can do, so they almost stagnate, that they do not take steps to make a change. So if we can focus on ways to give them back power, to show them how it is that they can manage their budget, that they may feel more confident in this current situation. Um, we will start with food. Um, food costs are likely going to be a, a predominant concern of, of service members. That um, increase in grocery prices have been due to several factors. So we've already talked about supply chain issues. Um, we have also recently dealt with the avian flu, weather events, and as we mentioned before, the, the war in Ukraine has, has stressed um, supply and prices as well. All of this has caused um, the cost of commodities to increase. And I want to 
kind of delve into these numbers a little a little bit more. So this is looking at the 12 month percentage change um, of the CPI of all items. And this was from January of 2023. So the 12 month change in prices of items. So remember, this is that market basket that we talked about before those approximately 95,000 items um, in January of 2023 was 6.4%. So this this is comparing it to January 2022. So of all items, there was an increase over that 12 month period of 6.4%. However, you can take that number and um, drill down into it to find specific categories or areas. And so as we look a little deeper, I pulled out food and energy specifically. And when we're looking at energy, that's going to include residential energy, um, heating, cooling, lighting, cooking, other household equipment, plus motor fuels. Um, when looking at food, um, food at home increased 11.3% between January 2022 and January 2023. Um, food away from home increased 8.2% in that same time period. And the average increase in food prices from January 22 to 23 is 10%. So we can tell just from this one graph that um, our food dollar is certainly not stretching as far as it would have a year ago because we are paying on average 10% more um, at for food consumption. Um, energy increased 8.7% in, in, in this same period. So this data tells us that food and energy are likely going to be um, two areas of significant concern when you're meeting with service members. So if we dig a little bit deeper into um, the food basket, I think it's important if we can look at which food products and food categories have experienced the most significant increase in pricing, because later when we talk about planning and strategies to manage our food dollar, knowing which of these areas have increased the most dramatically can help us make different choices with our food dollar. Um, so obviously this graph demonstrates that the most significant price increases over the last 12 months have been in cereals and bakery products, dairy and related products, um, and then other food at home and non-alcoholic beverages. I pulled out eggs specifically because everybody um, likes to talk about eggs right now. And there has been a dramatic increase in, in the price of eggs that um, the price of eggs increased 150 um, percent. And so if you think about that, that if you were paying um, two dollars for eggs, in January of 2021 and in January of 2023, so two years later, um, you're paying $5 for eggs. So that is a very significant increase in the price of a carton of eggs that a consumer most certainly notices at the grocery store. And that's one thing when we talk about inflation and we, and we say, well, it's the general rise in prices over time. When inflation is low, when inflation is at that 2% rate, um, we as consumers tend not to really note that that general rise in prices over time. We just kind of accept it because it's very small, it's very incremental, and so we just become accustomed to it because we do not notice the significant jump. But when eggs go from $2 to $5, that is a very significant jump. And so we as a consumer are going to be very, very aware of that change. And um, so talking a little bit about strategies of managing your food dollar. And we'll first start with, with food at home. And um, I think when you're these are strategies that you could suggest to the clientele in terms of reducing food expenditures. Uh, to begin with, seek substitutions. Look for alternatives. That can be either in product or in brand. Um, so generic brands 
typically equal savings and often have little change in, in quality of the product. Uh, you can encourage consumers to look at the differences in generic brands. Um, I know my local grocery store has a store brand and which is typically less expensive than the name brand product. But within that store brand, they have um, many different levels. I think they actually have three different levels of the store brand. I can notice very, very little difference when I go to the top level of the generic brand versus the name brand product. And in some instances, my family significantly prefers the, the top level of the generic brand product over the name brand product. And there, there is a significant decrease in price um, between the two. Um, you also want to think about meal prep and meal planning. And with this, you really want to evaluate your protein options. That protein can often be the most expensive part of the meal. So your, your meat, um, it can be costly. And so you want to look for ways to use less costly cuts of meat, different preparation strategies, um, and also look look for sales as specific towards meats. So we have a local grocery store that on Tuesdays, they run ground chuck for $2.99 a pound and boneless skinless chicken breast for $2.99 a pound. That is a significant savings over any other day of the week when the ground chuck is going to be $5.99 plus per pound and the boneless skinless chicken breast is going to be $4.99 plus per pound. Now, not everyone has the ability to go to the grocery store on Tuesdays. Um, in our household, my husband does most of our grocery shopping because he has a more flexible schedule than what, than what I do. But this morning before I left the house, I said, remember, it's Tuesday. It's ground beef and chicken day. Um, just as a reminder of, hey, today's the grocery store day because we tend to shop on Tuesday um, because of the reduced cost of protein on, on Tuesday. Um, certainly, you want to shop other ads and deals as well, um, using grocery store specials to meal plan. You can use the grocery store app to plan your grocery shopping list prior to going to the store. And I think, I think that is key, um, that you want to have a plan prior to going to the store. We do not always, as consumers, make the best decision when we are at the grocery. Um, believe it or not, that um, grocery stores are designed by marketing geniuses and they know how to encourage us to spend our food dollar in ways that we had not intended when we walked in the door. But when we have that plan in place, if we have it written down, if we have it in an app on our phone, if we have it as a note on our phone, whatever strategy works for the service member that you're working with, um, that when we walk in with the plan, we're much more likely to stick with the plan. Um, however, I think it's also important to note that when we're talking about shopping um, ads or shopping deals or using coupons, not to be tempted by a sale or a coupon if you do not like it or you do not use the product or if it is not something that you would have typically bought for that week. Um, if you purchase based on one of those reasons, just because it's a great deal, it's not really saving you money. It's costing you money because it's an additional purchase that you would not have typically made. Um, you also want to consider which stores you're shopping at. Not all stores are priced the same. Even when we're looking at name brand products, you can compare those across different types of stores, different grocery stores, or um, and that the, that name brand product could fluctuate in price from a few cents to maybe a dollar or more, depending on the product in the store. Um, having a conversation about shopping in season that, um, especially for those of us with an extension, this is a strategy that we talk about um, often with our clientele is understanding what are in season um, fruits and, and vegetables 
Um, a good example here is that both my kids take their lunch to school and um, I always try to make certain that they have a fruit in their lunch. And my little girl specifically likes to, she'll say, oh, can I have strawberries this week? Or can I have blueberries this week? And my response is always, you can have the fruit on sale this week. And sometimes that's grapes and sometimes that's strawberries and sometimes that's that's apples. They got real excited a couple of weeks ago because I came home with um, clementines and um, and my, my little girl actually said, were clementines on sale this week? Yes, the clementines were on sale this week. Um, so, so shop the, the fruits and vegetables that are in season um, because typically those tend to have, have good sales associated with, with this. I noticed earlier um, as folks were, were popping on that, that one of the folks that, that joined us today, I know historically that um, she's always bought blueberries when, when they're in season, that she lived in a part of the country that um, had a lot of blueberry production. And so there would be certain times of the year that blueberries were very, very inexpensive. Um, so just becoming aware of the, those um, times of year of when certain products are more and less expensive. Um, also want to think about um, buying in bulk. And I put asterisks next to this one because I always say it with a word of caution that most certainly buying in bulk can save you dollars. Um, it can be more expensive upfront because you might be buying in a larger quantity than you would typically buy, but price per unit, it could save you dollars. Um, however, you also want to um, calculate what are the additional costs associated with this? So do I have to have a store membership? You have to think about what is my ability to store this? Can I actually consume the, this quantity before it expires. So buying in bulk is certainly a strategy, but you do want to um, be cautious when recommending that and just kind of review with the service member of, well, what does buying in bulk mean? And how is it that I can manage this item in bulk? And depending on their lifestyle, they, they may not have the capability to, to actually store it um, and, and to make certain that it is safe uh, for consumption. Um, also certainly limiting eating out, that reducing um, food away from home expenditures is, is key when managing your food budget. Um, the price of eating out has not increased as much as um, food at the grocery store in terms of percentage, but it is certainly still more expensive than eating at home. So um, I always encourage folks to kind of um, take a moment and check how much is it that they're currently eating away from home? So analyze the current number of meals eaten away from home per week that um, sometimes individuals do not necessarily realize how much they're actually eating out until they have a conscious conversation about it or it's written down on paper and they can see the cost um, it is to, to eat out. And then work with them to identify strategies to reduce that number or to replace it with food at home. Um, Obviously, if, if they are in a living situation of where they might have a good pantry or a freezer, that you can always shop your pantry or freezer, that um, that's a good strategy, especially when you're trying to stretch that food dollar of what is it that I already have available. The internet is an amazing resource that um, you can go in and type in the, the items or the ingredients that you have in your house and come up with suggested recipes that might be new and different for your family. So encouraging people to kind of take a step back and saying, well, what is it that I have that every week I do not need to purchase every item that we are going to, to consume? And then um, to, to seek assistance um, if, if needed and necessary, that we're going to, to talk in a minute about some some assistance options and food insecurity, but certainly encourage a service member to ask for help if needed. Um, additionally, when working with service members, I think you want to most certainly point out the um, commissary benefit that perhaps one of the best strategies for service members to reduce food expenditures is to, is to utilize their commissary benefit. So reminding them that the commissary is there for, for them to use and can help them reduce food costs. 
All right, shrinkflation um, is um, is another topic to to think about, especially when we're talking about household consumables and and our food dollar. That um, in addition to coping with inflation, consumers are also managing shrinkflation. And shrinkflation is simply the combination of two words: um, shrink and inflation. And so shrinkflation is the shrinkage of the size of the product packaging, but the price remains constant. So they're giving us less of something. They have not changed the price, but um, obviously when we're getting less of it, our price per unit is increasing. So ultimately this decreases the amount of product, consumers are paying more per unit, and therefore we're experiencing inflation, um, but it's somewhat more hidden than some of the other examples that we've talked about. Um, the most common products uh, for shrinkflation are ice cream, bread, potato chips, candy, cereal, and cleaning supplies. And the, the CPI, the Consumer Price Index, it monitors the price per unit. And so therefore it attempts to capture any change, either smaller or bigger in their calculations. And um, uh, I'll give you all an example that I, um, and as I say this example, I always um, remind people that I teach finance, I do not teach nutrition, so please do not judge my eating choices here, but um, I eat a lot of saltine crackers, uh, saltine crackers and peanut butter is my breakfast of choice and it has been since uh, I was five or six years old. And so I'm very particular about my saltine crackers. And um, I've always been very loyal to one particular um, name brand of saltine crackers. And however, uh, I noticed a really kind of slightly pre-COVID, but certainly during the beginning of COVID, that um, the quality control seemed to be less, that they were crumbled more often, and sometimes they were burnt. And um, also the price was going up. And I just, I mean, I had been loyal to this brand for um, probably close to 40 years, but I just didn't feel like I was getting my value. So I started exploring other uh, store brands of crackers. And I went through a couple different um, brands of saltine crackers and eventually settled on one that um, I actually think is, is better than the name brand cracker that I'd been loyal to for years. Um, however, as we talked about, there's certainly been supply chain shortages and the name brand or the generic store brand cracker that I'd settled on, um, it it just disappeared off the shelves and it couldn't be gotten. And so I went back to my um, name brand cracker that I'd used for years. And the first time I opened up the box, so the external box was the exact same size that I have bought my entire life. Um, as I opened up the box and I pulled out the first sleeve of crackers, it was dramatically shorter than um, it had been when I was previously purchasing it. So at the grocery store, I certainly did not notice this change. The external box had not changed at all. And to be honest, if I didn't consume as many saltines as I consume, as a consumer, I probably wouldn't have noticed the change in the size of the sleeve, at least not initially. Because when I pulled it out and I was just aghast that they had shrunk the size of the sleeve of crackers, um, no one else in my family saw it. Um, and I had to explain, no, it's shorter I think you know and then I'm like I don't know maybe it's four crackers shorter or five crackers shorter I really wanted to know how many crackers they took out um and so I, I know that that's kind of a silly example but it it is very real about how a consumer cannot that they cannot really see when shrinkflation is is occurring um it is certainly going to be most common at the grocery store that consumers are going to experience shrinkflation at the grocery store um and it's a strategy that's used by suppliers to uh, avoid raising prices um, um or in an effort to increase profits um during a period of inflation i think it is often a strategy that's used to avoid rising prices so a consumer still feels like that they're paying the same um, but in reality they're not getting the same value 
Uh, as I mentioned, often this change in pack packaging is going to be very, very subtle and difficult for the consumer to realize, especially on first glance. So if we look at the percent of um, downsized items from 2015 to 2021, this just kind of shows you um, from, from the Bureau of Labor Statistics the most commonly tracked um, items over that time and uh, the percent of downsizing that they have experienced. You will notice household paper products on there at 1.8%. And um, when, when I think about this, uh, I think about toilet paper and um, as a consumer, how confused I stay about toilet paper with um, in terms of trying to compare my price per unit. I am very brand loyal to, to, a, to a specific brand of toilet paper, but they're constantly changing. It's giant roll, mega roll, double roll, triple roll, um, all of that is very confusing as a consumer. And so I've had to go down and, you know, figure out looking at the packaging of what is it that I am paying for one square of traditional toilet paper to truly figure out kind of my, my price per unit. So which one of these packages is really my best deal as a consumer? Um, I do think that this is somewhat of a interesting graph that it shows the downsize count. Um, and so this is how often products are being downsized. Um, I, I think it's fairly interesting to note that it, it is almost a reverse mimic of the inflation trend that as inflation was low, we were as consumers were experiencing a significant amount of downsizing. Um, however, as inflation started to tick up, um, that, that the amount of downsizing count has, has significantly reduced. So how is it that we manage um, shrinkflation? So I've talked a lot a bit uh, about this, but calculating that unit price, you know, in my toilet paper example, I need to know how much I'm paying for just the regular old roll of toilet paper and um, then figure out how many of those regular old rolls of toilet paper are there in the jumbo giant mega deluxe, whatever that packaging is on, on the toilet paper. Um, compare unit pricing across brands and so this is my my saltine example um, between the the name brand and the generic brand i will say that the store brand that i've settled on they have kept their full size sleeve, sleeve of crackers although i am mindful because you, sometimes you see these things in trends um, so i am mindful and curious to see if um, maybe in the next year or so that the the store brand cracker might shrink their size of the sleeve of cracker as as well. Um, that you want to be mindful of new branding that often when a product puts out a redesigned look, uh, this is especially true with ice cream, that um, when, when, a, when a product comes out in a redesigned look um, or the packaging is different, that you certainly want to check your price per unit because um, it, is, it is very plausible that the quantity that you're purchasing has changed. I often think about um, ice cream that I'm buying a gallon of ice cream because ice cream actually used to come in a gallon. It's very difficult at the grocery store now to find a true gallon of ice cream. Although it all looks pretty close to a gallon, um, there's certainly all different sizes cartons there. Um, again, we have the strategy of buying in bulk. Um, often when you're buying in bulk, you can, um, you can reduce shrinkflation, that it's not as prevalent, but you have those same cautions as, as I gave you before in terms of buying in bulk. Um, so we've talked about this is just how you manage your food dollar or um, how you can think about stretching your food dollar more. Um, but food insecurity is, is very, very real. And so food insecurity is when you're actually coping with not being able to access enough food um, to have or to lead an active, healthy life 
for all household members. And um, food insecurity actually decreased significantly during the first year of COVID. And um, that, that might seem um, not intuitive, especially as was mentioned earlier in terms of, well, if so many people, you know, um, lost their jobs or um, that they had less income, it seems like they would have less dollars to spend on food. However, there was a high charitable response during COVID. And so um, initially that we were able to, society was able to, to address food insecurity. However, it then, as COVID continued, it then increased. So the Urban Institute estimates food insecurity at um, 15.3% in April 21. Um, however, it increased substantially to one in five households um, or 21.4% by June of 2022. So a fairly significant jump um, over about a 14 month time frame. Um, for families of color, the number is estimated to be closer to 30%. And so we think about, well, what is impacting um, food security? One of those um, would be inflation, that inflation has eroded purchasing power. So an individual, especially one that is um, struggling to make ends meet, they cannot buy as much at the grocery store as they could purchased a year ago. Um, also, COVID safety nets expired. So um, during COVID, we had um, certain safety nets, such as the advance on the expanded child tax credit, um, the pandemic EBT program, which provided the equivalent value of school meals with school closed. Um, we had enhanced unemployment, enhanced um, SNAP benefits, universal access to school meals, that there were several safety nets in place. And so this again addresses that question that we had previously. Um, those safety nets have now ended. And so it can really be a double whammy, um, so to speak, for some families that they're trying to manage inflation while they have also lost the COVID safety nets that were in place for a period of time. As part of the focus um, on the food security and focus programming, that today we have a brief video on uh, using the two question food insecurity screening assessment. These questions are intended to identify at risk service members and families so that they may be connected to programs that can help. So we're going to take a minute to watch the video. As you begin engaging in conversation and assessing a service member's current food security, recognize that food insecurity can occur whenever there is stress on resources in a household, time or money. The key is to start the conversation, perhaps at a morning stand-up, during a feedback session, or any time you may meet with your service members. The USDA defines food security for a household as the means to access by all members at all times to enough food for an active, healthy life. Food insecurity is defined as the limited or uncertain availability of nutritionally adequate and safe foods, or limited or uncertain ability to acquire acceptable foods in socially acceptable ways. Food insecurity may not always be visible, and asking families about food security may feel intrusive, but it is important to identify families who are food insecure or at risk for becoming food insecure so they may be connected to services. When meeting with families, you might say, the issue of not having enough food or the type of food you need to do your mission is a real concern. There are two proven questions to help understand if you are dealing with food insecurity. I would like to ask them now. If the answer to either question is yes, I want to get you connected to resources that can help, depending on your situation. Please know that food insecurity is just as common for single service members as for married service members. To screen for food insecurity, ask if the following two statements are often true, sometimes true, or never true. Within the past 12 months, we worried whether our food would run out before we got money to buy more. Within the past 12 months, the food we bought just didn't last and we didn't have money to get more. A response to either question of often true or sometimes true can indicate potential food insecurity. It is important to understand why the potential exists in order to connect the service member with appropriate resources. You could say, I have some resources I want to share with you that can help get you the support you need. 
To find resources, please visit militaryonesource.mil and find the Economic Toolkit for Service Providers. Scroll down and click on the ACT button to download a PDF of food security resources and programs. If the service member gives a response of never true, you may say that food may become an issue in the future, especially during a move or other transitions. Please reach out or call Military OneSource if you need support. If the service member or family is on an installation, you can also suggest they reach out to their Military and Family Support Center. After a service member seeks out additional assistance, continue to follow up on their progress and the resolution to barriers affecting their financial well-being. So I know many of you are following along in the chat pod, but I do want to call attention to that our um, organizers have dropped in the link to the economic toolkit for service providers available on Military One Source. They've provided you the link in the in the chat pod. Um, so now I kind of want to circle back to covering the basics that we really talked about food, but when working with service members, you certainly want to review other essential budget categories. So expenses, expenses such as household utilities, uh, gasoline, other necessities, and that understanding the price change in necessity and how it impacts the household budget is very important. So walking through some of those examples, an individual might not understand how much more they are spending per week or per month due to some of the price increases. So helping them understand how much more they're spending on necessities may help them understand why they need to reduce other budget categories. Um, I also think it's good just to have a conversation about acknowledging the general rise in prices and cost of living. That um, sometimes when an individual feels like that, that they're struggling with their budget or they're certainly not saving as much as they were previously, or they're they're not getting to the end of the month as easy as they were as they were previously, um, is just to having this general understanding of what might be causing that can um, again it bring some some form of understanding and peace to the person and help them realize that they need to make a change that they cannot continue um, their behavior as it was previously. I do want to take a few minutes um, and talk about the pandemic housing boom that um, home prices literally skyrocketed um, during the, the pandemic. And this has then created a crisis in affordable housing. And we see this. Um, it's certainly um, more pronounced in some areas of the country, but it is true across the country. Um, so why did prices increased so dramatically during the pandemic. Um, again, back to supply and demand, that there was significant increase in demand. Um, as people started working from home and as some positions transitioned to full-time work from home, that there was a demand for more space, that um, people wanted more square footage um, if they were going to be in their home more. Um, also, the um, millennials, America's biggest generation ever, is aging into their home buying years. So there's more people wanting to buy a home than what there has been previously. Um, that has created a housing shortage, that there is a lack of number of units. I have a cousin that's a, a home builder. He develops um whole neighborhoods and it's fascinating to listen to him talk about the shortage of units in his home county or the county that he builds in and um, what the population projections are and how he can base his pricing strategy um, off of those off of those numbers. So the housing housing shortage is is most certainly um, real. That investors have um, turned to the housing market as well. And so um, you probably noticed, regardless of your geographic area, signs popped up everywhere of, are you selling your property? Um, 
random texts and calls that investors have looked to get into the home um, buy or to look to get into the housing market. And um, then also uh, historically low mortgage rates. So um, there was record low mortgage rates in January 2021 um, of 2.65%. When, when mortgage rates are low, when borrowing is cheap, um, home prices tend to increase because an individual can spend more on a house because they're spending less in interest. So these are all factors that drive up home prices. Um, it has also unfortunately made home ownership unaffordable to many. Um, however, as home prices go up, rent prices go up as well, um, that puts further strain on the family budget. We just continue to circle back to that concept of supply and demand. So I have just a couple graphs to demonstrate um, kind of what we've experienced in the change of pricing. So the median home price um, in January of 1963 was $19,300. If we adjust that for today's dollars, that would be approximately $190,000. However, um, at the end of the fourth quarter of 2022, average home price was $535,800. So you can see um, the significant jump in cost of living in terms of um, home ownership. Uh, if we just look at average sale price of houses sold 2000 to 2022, so um, more recent time frame, um, average home pricing at Q1 of 2007 was $322,100. Um, if we adjust that for today's dollars, that would be $476 thousand um, dollars. The reason I picked Q1 2007 is because that was the housing um, bubble or boom that led into the Great Recession. Um, so housing prices had peaked during that time. To, to, so to give you some perspective of um, how we felt then, most of us can remember that. So how we felt then with home prices versus what um, home prices cost today and the significant increase. We are currently coming off the pandemic housing boom. So inflation most certainly can shift the housing market. So as we've talked about that increases in inflation are matched with increases in the interest rate. And um, as the cost of borrowing goes up, this tends to slow the housing market. Um, so as we continue to see those incremental increases in interest rates, most likely through the rest of 2023, um, we'll start to see the housing market mitigate again to an extent. Um, inflation also impacts building supplies, new construction, um, remodeling, um, anything associated with housing inflation is, is going to impact it. I will say that housing prices, um, although we are coming off the boom, they are still, they are still very high. This slide um, demonstrates the dip in mortgage rates coinciding with the increase in um, home prices. And then as rates have increased um, recently, the market has cooled somewhat. So the rental market tends to mimic the housing market. And many of your service members, especially younger service members, they may be renting. Uh, so we're going to spend some time talking about, about rental strategies. So um, rent prices go up when home prices go up. Um, as the housing market has slightly cooled in, in 2023, um, I guess we should say we'll wait and see if there'll be some relief in, in the rental market. Um, historically, there, there would be, so we will see in the current um, situation. But again, the word relief is going to be, um, be very relative, that rental prices are still comparatively very high. And so when we look at managing rental inflation, um, 
although it is anticipated that we may have um, some decline in mid-23 and beyond, um, reviewing the strategies for service members and their family to save on housing is certainly always helpful. Um, I think one of the first strategies is, can they continue their current lease? Often a landlord will continue a current lease at the same terms, especially if the tenant has been a quote unquote good tenant. They've paid on time, they've paid ahead of time, they've taken care of the property, that a landlord may be a much more likely to extend the lease for an additional 12 months or whatever the lease terms are at the current rental rate, um, as opposed to increasing the prices. Um, can an individual negotiate services? So can services be negotiated for, with the landlord? So for example, is the landlord currently paying someone for a mowing service or for snow removal? Is that something that the renter can take on um, themselves and lower the rent payments? My parents actually have several rental properties and um, my dad always negotiates the lawn mowing in, into the, the rental contract that um, he's he's passed mowing a lot of yards and um, lawn mowing services are expensive so if a renter is willing to um, mow the yard that he's always very willing to take fifty dollars off or whatever it may be off the monthly rent so that he does not have to contract with the mowing service um, to get that taken care of so just um what is it that the renter can do that can save the landlord money that can help with the rental costs um, consider consider less populated areas. Um, can you move to an area with less demand or the suburbs? Um, although this is also said with a word of caution that as we look at living farther away from where we um, from where we work and our kids go to school and um, we have our friends and family, et cetera, um, that there will be increases of drive time, gasoline. So there's other factors to consider when um, moving to a less populated area. Um, can they reassess space needs? Is downsizing an option? Do they need as much space as they currently have? Certainly it's nice to have the extra bedroom as a luxury for storage or closet or for a family member to come and visit or for friends to come and visit for a weekend, but can you reduce space? Um, and then also, especially if we're looking at rental units, not necessarily housing, but many rental units will have amenities such as pools, exercise facilities, tanning, whatever it may be. Um, and certainly these amenities are nice, but they are all wants. They're not needs that we have to have with our housing. Um, so could they consider rental units that have less extras because those extras tend to add up? So looking beyond food and housing expenses, I have a few charts that I'm gonna flip through fairly quickly, um, but just focused in somewhat on um, electricity prices that um, we're looking at the amount of change in the previous 12 months. So from January, um, 22 to January 23. Um, in this particular graph, energy prices or electricity prices, excuse me, increased almost 15%, um, which again is going to be very significant month after month in our budget. If we look at the price per gallon of gasoline, um, that from January uh, of 2021 to January of 2023, so looking at 24 month period then, um, price per gallon of gasoline increased by almost a dollar. It went from $2.34 to $3.33. Um, the average American consumes 16 to 17 gallons of gasoline per week. Um, so that's nearly an increase of $70 a month, that $1 increase in the price per gallon of gasoline which equates to $884 per year. Now, as consumers, we cannot control the price of gasoline, but helping individuals become more aware of, oh, I'm spending nearly $1,000 more per year on gas. This is why I need to cut expenses elsewhere. And then also um, non-durable goods, um, which are items um, with a life expectancy of less than three years. So paper products, plastics, clothing, shoes, diapers. You can see how, how that has kind of changed over time, especially from, from 2020 through the end of 2022. 
So how is it that we protect against inflation? I um, want to um, talk a little bit with that about elastic and inelastic goods. And so an inelastic good is something that it's difficult to change our quantity demanded regardless of price. So we just talked about gasoline, that yes, we can limit what we spend on gas to an extent. Um, we don't necessarily have to take a cross country vacation, but for most of us, the gasoline that we use is what we need to drive to work, to pick our kids up at school, to go to the grocery store, that type thing. Um, so we have to pay what it costs. We as consumers have limited ability to adjust that. So that is an inelastic good. Regardless of the price of gasoline, I'm going to continue to buy it. Um, elastic goods have substitutions. So if when looking at their budget, you can identify what are those elastic goods? What are those things that have alternatives or ways to lower the costs. Um, goods and services are often um, elastic, so luxury items, vacations, um, things that it is easy. So, um, you know, I'm in Kentucky. Um, well, I could take a family vacation to Tennessee, so I could go three hours down the interstate, or I could take a family vacation to the West Coast. Um, it's going to be a much cheaper for me to take a vacation to Tennessee than the West Coast. So how is it that I can substitute plans that my family has? Also want to address spending leaks. Um, we're all familiar with this concept of spending leaks. So it just commonly refers to those dollars that are unintentionally spent. That's the candy bar, the sports drink at the gas station, the impulse buy at the grocery store um, are all great examples of, of spending leaks. Um, used to, when we used to spend on cash, I would often tell people, this is what, um, when you have $100 in your pocket on Monday morning, and by the end of the work week, you're like, where did that money go? It's money that just leaves you that does not necessarily have a name or a purpose associated with us. Um, um, previously, when we spent on cash, you felt that. You could recognize at the end of the week of, wow, I spent $100 this week and don't know where it went um, because you missed the money in your wallet. So as a consumer, we were aware or at least more aware. And sometimes that would put us in a little check and I would think, well, next week I need to do a little better. I need to figure out where those dollars went. Um, now that we're much more of a cashless society, we do not feel the spending leaks at near the same way as that we that we um, felt them previously. So it's a little bit more difficult to have this um, wow moment of where did my money go? But I do think it's very important when working with your service member clientele that you help them understand the concept of spending leaks. Um, it, I would highly, highly encourage a spending diary. Um, I know that I work with a lot of young people as well, especially for younger service members. This is probably not going to be um, a well-received suggestion, but if you can help come up with strategies, so can they take notes on their phone? There's a plethora of apps out there that you can use to track your spending, but some way to realize where those dollars are going of, yes, that gas station soft drink does cost $2 and that adds up if I get it every time I go to the gas station. Another significant spending leak that I feel like we need to address is online food delivery services. And this is a fairly new phenomenon. Um, you know, when I was growing up, meal delivery services were limited to pizza and Chinese food. Um, now you can literally have meal delivery services from any mainstream um, restaurant. Uh, this really started in early 2000s, increased dramatically with smartphone usage. But then we saw another dramatic increase, obviously, um, during, during COVID. So restaurants of all types participate. Um, it is estimated that Americans spend $26.5 million per year on food delivery services. I'll repeat that number again, $26.5 million. Um, meal delivery services are most certainly a significant spending leak. 
they have greatly increased the consumer's ability to eat out, but they are not inconvenienced to actually have to leave the house. So um, in my house, we do not do food delivery services, but sometimes we'll eat at home because we just don't want to have to leave the house. So it keeps us from spending the, those food dollars away from home, but this takes away um, that, that inconvenience. Um, I would really encourage you if you notice that you have a client that uses a lot of meal delivery services of sit down with them, pull out a piece of paper and a pencil and really walk them through the true costs of the food delivery services. Um, Food delivery services certainly cost more than just the price of food, and those additional costs add up. So you're going to have delivery fees, service fees, tips. Um, all these are considered hidden expenses associated with food delivery services. It is estimated that those hidden expenses add 36% to the total bill. Um, so again, I would I would highly encourage um, just sitting down with a piece of paper and a pencil, you, you know, well, where did you get your meal delivery service for? What did you buy? Add that up, then look at the other, because they'll have it on their receipt, look at the other expenses associated with it, and um, kind of have a conversation about costs versus convenience and where they're placing their dollar and how they're spending their dollar. I would certainly also re remind all of your service member clients tell about the availability of um, on-base dining facilities and dining halls and um, how that might save them in dollars as well and also has the the add of convenience that they're not having to prepare prepare that food so when we look at managing spending leaks um, planning planning is key having every dollar have have, have a purpose is is very important um, identifying triggers um, what is it that makes that makes an individual um, spend those dollars that they were not intending to spend? Is it if they go to work at the end of the day or they go to the grocery at the end of the day and they're hungry and so they spend more at the grocery store than they intended? Um, is there something that um, can I, I again don't judge my food choices. I have somewhat of a soft drink habit. Are there certain triggers in the day that say, hey, I'm going to walk across the street to um, the convenience store and get a fountain drink? So helping talk through what are those triggers and how is it that they can avoid those triggers? Reviewing what is spent, this can be eye opening to individuals at times. Um, and then also having a conversation about or what are alternative options that you can have in place. Um, often spending leaks can be associated with peer pressure. And I know that we do not tend to think about peer pressure in adulthood, but it's it's very real. Um, while we've been on this, this call today, I've gotten a text from a coworker that said, hey, do you wanna get lunch today? Well, those dollars could be considered a spending leak if I had planned to bring my lunch from home today. Um, so going out to eat with that coworker at lunchtime will, would, would be dollars that I had not intentionally planned to spend. So um, having a conversation about, well, when the coworker says, hey, you know, do you want to go out for lunch today or whatever may be more relevant in your service member's life about um, where those dollars are getting spent unintentionally, having suggested alternatives. So if it is that there's a group that likes to get together and, and go out to eat at a restaurant, can they eat, um, can they all go over to an individual's house and eat and trade off over certain periods of time? Um, have suggested alternatives so a person is not just saying no, that they're giving Giving a suggestion that saves them and the other individuals money. I um, do want to talk about overall short-term strategies as we begin to wind down today of managing inflation. And a lot of these we have hit on during our conversation today, but I do want to go back and really emphasize them. Um, to begin with, um, limit extras or luxury spending. And, and luxury spending is really not a term of what you might initially think that um, most of us do not go out and buy luxuries, but really luxury spending is um, spending beyond the essentials. So um, it, it is 
it is above and beyond what we need. So how is it that we that we limit those wants? Um, we talked a lot about um, housing pricing, um, postponing any form of optional home improvement. Now, what we do not want to encourage is postponing routine home maintenance. Um, that's somewhat of a trend that we see um, when um, people are trying to stretch their dollar and kind of managing um, increased um, cost of living is they're not wanting to reduce their standard of living. So they might delay home maintenance, um, thinking that it doesn't really need to be done. You see the same thing with vehicle maintenance. Well, maybe they try and stretch their oil chain um, a, a thousand extra miles, um, or maybe they're not changing their furnace filters as often as they should. We do want to um, encourage continued um, um, maintenance, but for big projects, we don't necessarily have to renovate the bathroom or if the refrigerator is working, we don't need a slick new one. So kind of postponing those optional home improvement products, projects. And um, we've talked just a lot about spending leaks. What are they? Where are those, where are those dollars going? How is it that we can plug that leak? Um, subscriptions and monthly fees are huge in our budget. So this would be the, um, the TV services, the um, subscription music services, um, it, you know, what, whatever it may be, kind of those monthly fees that sometimes you don't even realize that, that you have them because you've had them for so long, um, that, that taking a, a step back and looking where all is it that we subscribe to, what is it that we're not getting the value of? What is it that we're not actually using? And how is it that we can cut those subscriptions and monthly fees? Um, set utility bills on a budget plan that um, some um, utility companies, uh, often um, gas and electricity, will offer the opportunity to do a budget plan for your utilities. So instead of charging you usage per month, they take your average usage um, over the year and charge you that per month. So um, typically with gas, you pay more in the winter if you have gas, heat, and less in the summer. Well, this would divide your total expenses over the cost of the year. So you're paying a constant amount, which makes it easier to put in your budget. Um, Easy strategy, adjust your thermostat a few degrees. Um, any small steps that you can take to, to save um, will add up over time. Do you have unwanted, unused items? Um, just things that you want to move out of your house, can you sell them? Do they have value associated with them? Uh, review your insurance plans. Um, you want to remain adequately insured, but are you overinsured? Um, take a look at your deductibles. Can um, can you manage a larger a larger deductible to reduce your your insurance costs? And then defer purchases. So if you're looking at significant purchases, um, can they wait till later? Um, some um, items, used cars specifically, they've increased dramatically in price over the last couple years. Um, can you delay the purchase of a new or a new to you car um, for a little while longer to see if those prices start to come down as supply and demand begin to balance out? Um, Long-term strategies. We certainly want to encourage people to continue to maintain an emergency fund. Um, that this is not the time to not have um, dollars that you might need if uh, an unfortunate event occurs. However, you probably don't want to keep a lot of cash reserves that um, interest rates are higher now than what they have been. Um, so if you have liquid dollars um, above and beyond your emergency fund and your, your monthly kind of cost of living of what you're comfortable with. Are there still secure investments? Yes, there are, but um, looking into what secure investments may be a best choice for the, for the service member. Um, also with that emergency fund, can you find a higher yield savings um, or a higher yield money market account that still allows the funds to remain very liquid, very accessible, but that might be paying a higher interest rate so that it's more likely to pace inflation. Um, individuals can do an energy audit on their home. Where are their energy leaks? We talked a lot about the increase in energy costs. Where are their energy leaks and what can be done to mitigate it? Um, again, would say that with a word of caution of take a step back and say, 
um, what is it going to cost me to make this change and what's going to be my return on investment. Um, consider home ownership. Real estate has always been considered a good hedge against inflation. However, this has the asterisk, right? So here's your caution that real estate prices um, and interest rates are currently high, comparatively speaking. So this would certainly be a long range consideration and not necessarily a recommendation um, for today. Um, always a general sound strategy is to limit consumer debt, um, especially um, if um, they have variable interest rates, as interest rates go up, uh, individuals are going to be paying more to manage or to maintain that consumer debt. So paying off and limiting consumer debt is certainly a solid long-term strategy. Um, inflation and retirement. So clients should consider the impact of inflation when weighing investing risks and goals, including retirement goals. Um, with knowledge of how inflation rates affect the value of assets, you can ensure that you are helping clients make decisions with a clear understanding of the full picture. Uh, when working with clients, it may be useful to have a calculator to run different scenarios of how inflation could impact savings over time. Uh, the Office of Financial Readiness has developed the Savings Tax and Inflation Calculator that you can use in your work with clients. Uh, the example on the screen shows how a $1,000 initial investment with a $200 monthly contribution could be impacted by tax and inflation over 20 years. The dark blue is the balance without taking taxes and inflation into consideration, and the light blue is adjusted for an inflation rate of 3% in state and federal taxes. You can use this calculator to simulate different scenarios with your clients. And um, again, in the chat pod, um, they have dropped the link to check out the Office of Financial Readiness's savings calculator that the website is in there. As we wrap up today, the Military, uh, Military One Source is another great resource. This resource was um, plugged in the chat earlier on in the presentation, and um, the link is going to be dropped again now. Service providers should review the Economic Security Toolkit for Military One Source. This toolkit helps define economic security issues like housing availability, food security, and financial well being, and provides tools and resources to help support your service members and their families. All right, that has been a lot of information over the um, last 90 minutes. Um, the, the last half of the presentation that we've talked about um, really focused it in on managing inflation and prioritizing essentials. So we have just a few minutes left. I'm not even certain if we have enough time for questions, but Dr. Gillen, any questions that you would like to address? Thank you, Dr. Hunter. I think you have addressed all of the questions that have come through in the chat. And thank you to everyone who has contributed to the conversation today. Check out DOD's online resources available for personal financial man managers and counselors from the FinRed and MillSpouse Money Mission websites to the Sense mobile app, e-newsletters, and social media. Access the financial well-being assessment, conversation cards, media kits, spending plan worksheets, the net worth tracker, and so much more. In CE credits, please click on the link for the evaluation on the event page through the purple continuing education button. Our current session is approved for 1.5 CEU credits for financial professionals, including AFCs and CPFCs, board certified patient advocates, those certified in family and consumer sciences, certified in personal finance educators, board certified case managers, registered dietitians, nutritionists, and nutrition and dietitian technicians registered. Certificates of attendance are also available for those interested in, a, in documenting additional professional development activities. While completing the evaluation, we would sincerely appreciate specific suggestions for future webinar topics that could be used directly in your work with service members. 
At the end of the evaluation, please choose the correct link for your accreditation. Depending on your accreditation, you may be directed to a post-test. Once you pass the post-test with an 80% or higher, you'll receive a certificate of completion by email. Please be sure to click all the way through to the end to receive your certificate. Some email providers will direct your certificate to the spam folder, so check there if you haven't received the certificate within 24 to 48 hours. If you have any questions about CE opportunities, please email me at oneoppersonalfinance at gmail.com. Go to oneop.org to access free CE opportunities, blogs, and other resources. You can also follow us on social media for daily resources and one-op programming updates. As we are winding down our time together today, I will leave the slides up for just a few more moments so that you can collect any links you need from the chat. If you have questions about CEUs, please visit the event page and select the purple continuing education button. The recording for the webinar will be available on the event page in the next 24 hours in case you'd like to go back and review anything, and also so you can share this information with your colleagues. Thank you all so much for joining us today, and we'll see you next time. And thank you again to Dr. Hunter. Thank you all. I enjoyed the opportunity to be here.